Hello, it's Scott Manley here. In July 2011, Space Shuttle Atlantis launched on STS-135, the last space shuttle mission. And since then, the US has not had the ability to launch crew into space. Since then, of course, all crew have traveled to the space station using the Russian Soyuz launch vehicle, a design which actually dates from the 1960s. But next year, we'll see the return of domestic launch capability in the form of SpaceX's Dragon and Boeing's Starliner. And I can sense there's a number of you out there already grumbling about this terrible gap in US launch capabilities, asking why wasn't there a replacement for the space shuttle? Well, the truth is, there have been many replacements for the space shuttle developed, but none of them actually ended up flying. Well, at least not yet, we can look forward to the SLS, a launch vehicle derived from space shuttle components, the boosters, the engines, the tank. It seems like such a logical idea, you'll wonder why nobody has tried it before. Except, this picture here isn't the SLS, this is the NLS, the National Launch System. This was investigated back in 1991, and if you put it right next to the SLS, you can see there's a lot in common. A pair of space shuttle boosters helping to lift an orange cryogenic propellant tank and a cluster of main engines. Except that this isn't SLS, this is Ares 5 from the Constellation program. But this, ladies and gentlemen, is the real deal, or at least an artist's impression of the real deal, because the real deal is still being built. These are what are called shuttle-derived vehicles because, of course, they're derived from shuttle components. And these are, have been a very easy sell to politicians. Because, well, of course, you know, first of all, you can say that since you're reusing shuttle components, it means that you don't have to do all that expensive R&D. But more importantly, it means you get to keep the same contractors happy. And of course, that was incredibly important for any politician which was looking at replacing the space shuttle because you did not want to be the person getting blamed for thousands of people potentially losing their jobs after their essential space gizmo got eliminated from that all-important contract. As it happens, the suppliers didn't even wait until the space shuttle was launched before coming up with their alternative ideas. This concept art from Thiokol, again, looks very similar to what we're talking about today in terms of the SLS, with a pair of strap-on boosters and a core tank. Of course, because this was before the space shuttle really started flying, the external tank was still white back then. Also around this time, Boeing seriously looked at replacing the orbiter with its wings and crew cabin with a much more basic payload fairing with engines attached. They came up with potential payloads of up to 68 tons, and by the mid-80s, this actually became seriously considered in the form of Shuttle C. Now, this had serious research time and money put into it, as evidenced by the fact that instead of concept art, we have these high-quality 1980s computer graphics. Anyway, the designers went through many iterations of the design, but, you know, they typically were looking at launching 45 to 50 tons per launch, and this was, of course, pitched as being a great way to support the forthcoming Space Station Freedom concept. One problem was that the Space Shuttle main engines were pretty expensive, about $38 million each. So the designers proposed that they would only use engines that had already flown on shuttles and which had essentially reached the end of their useful life. This seemed nice on paper, but the problem was that it then limited the number of launches, and if they were going to use fresh engines, then that would be a whole lot more expensive. Ultimately, it ended up looking like the whole thing would have cost more per kilogram than the most expensive expendable launch vehicles at the time. And so in 1990, the program was officially cancelled, but not before they had built this rather nice mock-up. The year after, I guess there was a little room in the budget, so some money was spent to study the National Launch System. Now, while this never flew, one interesting part of this is the engines on that. Those aren't Space Shuttle main engines, those are Space Transportation main engines. The idea being to take the Space Shuttle main engine and create a cheaper, expendable version. And development and testing of hardware did actually happen along these lines at Aerojet. Of course, it never eventually appeared as the STME, but it did become the RS-68, which powers the uh, Delta IV. The National Launch System didn't get very far because it entered a world where they were having to pay for the Space Station Freedom and the Space Shuttle program, so a third very expensive program just wasn't on the cards. 
But lots of white papers and studies from the era continued to use it as a baseline for a launch vehicle for getting spacecraft that would ultimately go to the moon or Mars. Anyway, most of the 90s remained focused on the space station and the space shuttle, but 2000 brought this space launch initiative, including the X-33 test vehicle. This was a subscale test vehicle which would explore the technologies required for single stage to orbit os uh, operation, including your know, novel composite materials and the linear aerospike engine. It was probably the most famous part of the space launch initiative and unfortunately after about 80% plus of the vehicle had been built it was cancelled. In particular it's often cited that they had issues and delays with developing the composite fuel tanks to contain liquid hydrogen and oxygen. Some at the time even said that the materials were incompatible with cryogenic operation but time has uh, proven them wrong. They did actually solve the various problems even after the vehicle was uh, no longer going to fly. And then, of course, in 2003, the Columbia disaster brought into focus the fact that they needed to come up with a replacement for the space shuttle. And so in 2005, the Constellation program was born. It included a number of Ares rockets derived from uh, the space shuttle hardware. It also included the Orion capsule, which does actually exist and has actually been built into something that has flown and will fly. Now the original Ares 5 design would be using uh, the RS-68 engines that were designed to be expendable. However, actually, towards the end of the program it was realised that having a carbon ablative nozzle next to these giant solid rocket boosters that were designed for the space shuttle would lead to too much heat that would actually cause the nozzle to erode too quickly and so therefore they had to upgrade it to space shuttle main engines and that then became pretty much the direct ancestor of what is the SLS. And in 2009 the Constellation program did actually get a vehicle flying. This is the Ares 1, it's essentially a solid rocket booster from the space shuttle with an upper stage bolted on that was supposed to carry a crewed vehicle into orbit. This would be essentially the equivalent of the Soyuz, it would transport crew to and from the space station. The launch was a partial success, it did have issues with the, the booster recontacting the upper stage and other problems like that, but uh, there was also a sort of relatively notorious paper published by a, uh, the US Air Force that demonstrated that the abort system on this was hideously dangerous and would pretty much result in everyone dying if they had to abort during this launch because the debris the you know, coming off of this would destroy any parachutes. But that wouldn't kill it. No, what would kill it would be the fact that the Constellation program was hideously over budget and behind schedule by 2009. And in parallel, another program had been started called Commercial Orbital Transportation Services. This includes the commercial cargo transportation that we already see in terms of Dragon and Cygnus. And it was also looking at expanding the scope to include crew services. So in 2009, there's a report called the Augustine Report which pretty much published all this stuff and so the government decided that it was better to cancel the Constellation program and focus on commercial services instead. But then a year later a slightly reduced scope version comes along. It keeps Orion capsule which was pretty far into development at that point and then it essentially creates the SLS which was the Ares 5 but it's modified. And of course this was very popular with politicians because again it made sure that that shuttle money was going to continue flowing to the various contractors that were supplying the engines and rockets and various other materials. And that mostly brings us up to date. The year after the shuttle stopped flying, SpaceX started delivering cargo to the space station and next year we're going to get a Dragon and Starliner flying. But we probably could have had commercial crew running a bit sooner. It was terribly underfunded early on. In particular, Senator Richard Shelby used his role in appropriations committees to stack the deck against commercial crew and divert money to the SLS program. And then later he had the gall to argue that because commercial crew was now behind schedule, that it should lose even more of its money to SLS. Of course, this hasn't stopped him trying to claim credit when uh, the astronauts were announced for the commercial crew program. But look, to be fair, a shuttle replacement was sorely needed a long time before 2009. 
All these programs really suffered from the problem that the, the shuttle may have had its issues, but it was good enough until suddenly it wasn't going to be flying anymore. To be clear, SLS does have its uses, it does have its niches, although some might argue that the uh, uses are being designed around the SLS, but it's easy to see that there are things that basically SpaceX and ULA aren't set up to do. But in the near future, we should see crew transportation removed from that list. The switch over to commercial crew transportation services is, has been slow, it has been painful, but ultimately it's probably the best thing, not just for NASA, but for space industry as a whole. So I, like many of you, will be looking forward to these commercial launches for next year. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.